starts with the story of a baby born in Bethlehem. It ends with the glory of a spotless lamb being raised again. The earth is rejoicing. Heaven and nature sing its Christmas morning. Come and see what the angels see this blessed morning. Christmas, would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to read a passage of scripture from Isaiah the prophet. Let's hear this ancient prophecy this morning to prepare our hearts to worship Jesus. Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Father God, we were born in the darkness of sin, each one of us. God, we need the light of Jesus, the light that has come into the world. God, help us walk in the light as you are in the light so that we can have fellowship with one another and with you, God, through a relationship 
with Jesus Christ through faith in him and him alone for salvation. For it's in him alone that we can even come before you and worship this morning. God, I pray, God, for anyone here that might feel the heaviness of that darkness this morning. Lord, that the light of Jesus would shine upon them, that the power of Jesus would break the sin in their life, that they would come to you in faith, knowing that Jesus is real, that Jesus loves them so much that he gave himself. For to them, a child is born. And we will have hope forevermore. Lord, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity for worship, God. We wanna to continue to lift up our voices in song to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
said over the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This next song, angels, we have heard on high, that's the chorus, Gloria in excelsis Deo. In English, it means glory to God in the highest. Let's give him all the glory this morning. Yeah. 
shall cease day God, we thank you for Jesus, the King of Israel and the Savior of the world. God, we thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to worship you through Jesus and to worship and give glory to Jesus, God. We pray this in his name, amen. You may be seated. Merry Christmas, brothers and sisters. It is it's good to be with you all. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we believe that you are not here by chance. Uh, we believe God has brought you here to worship the risen Lord Savior. And it wasn't by chance that he was born either. It was according to the purpose of God to save a people for himself. And so we pray that as you visit with us that you feel welcomed and you feel that God has led you here uh, tonight, I do have a couple announcements for us. Tonight, a Christmas Eve service, we're holding our and, annual candlelight service. There's going to be two services, uh, one at 3 p.m. and then one at 5 p.m. Uh, there's going to be special music, uh, devotional by Dr. Gary, and our traditional candle lighting as we sing together with lights, uh, candlelight. Um, it's amazing. Uh, so if, if, you, if you're able to come out, please come. Uh, there will be kids ministry during that time through age uh, grade three. Uh, so it's going to be a great time tonight, our Christmas Eve service. Uh, next announcement would be next Sunday, December 31st, uh, we're going to join together as a church family to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we want to make that announcement so that this week we can be preparing our hearts, examining our hearts before the Lord as we approach his table next week, humbly and honestly seeking to uh, join together as a family to remember the Lord's death for us. Uh, now as we turn to the Lord to give our offerings, uh, let's pray. 
Father in heaven, you are the giver of every good and every perfect gift. Father, and that the greatest gift, the supreme gift, the gift above all other gifts is the gift of your son that you gave to us. And if, if you were to give him us, if you would not spare the eternal son of God who reigns with you, who is the word made flesh, if you would not spare him, will you not give us all things, Father? And so, Father, we come now as we think about giving, we think about your generosity. As we think about opening our hands and loosening our grips on our material possessions, our funds, our talents, our time, we give so freely, so cheerfully, so sacrificially because of the gift you've given us. And we believe that this gift of Jesus, this message of the gospel changes the world. And so we want to see it advance. We want to see it pressed into the darkest corners of Sheboygan County and to the nations. And so we give. We can't wait to give more and more for your glory, knowing that our reward is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can remain seated for the song.
heart longs for a little bit of hope. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. God, we celebrate your first coming, first coming of Jesus right now in this Christmas season. Lord, and it makes us long for your second coming. God, may we find our hope, our satisfaction in the person, the God, man, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the hope that comes through him. Teach us now, God, as we together submit gladly to your word and the preaching of your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. I'll be reading from John 1, 14 through 18. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Two. All right. It was, um, that was my fault. <laughs> Merry Christmas, friends. Here we are together to gather in the name of Jesus, and uh, we're so thankful that you're, you're here with us. Looking forward to an amazing uh, day today. I just want to say thank you to the Lord for all that he's done in providing uh, faithful servants, uh, Aaron and the various teams, our tech team in the back, choir this morning, uh, the strings, we go on and on with 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock. The music that you'll hear today, by God's grace, we trust, will carry us into his presence. And it takes a lot of people giving a lot. And every one of them would say, and, and does say to me, it's no sacrifice. It's, it's our honor to be here on Christmas Eve and give lots and lots of time so that Jesus is sensed and seen clearly. And that's our heart. Praise the Lord. Welcome. If uh, the, you're, this is your first time here in a while, or um, you're here with family members, I just want you to really feel a special welcome. If you're joining us online uh, for various reasons, a special welcome to you that, that this is a place where you're going to hear and know God's word we trust, and where, again, Jesus is going to be seen clearly. That is our heart's desire. So as we go to the Lord this morning, we're going to pray, and uh, then we will um, pick it up. In uh, verse 14, we, we've heard 14 through 18, and we're going to focus our attention on those verses this morning. Let's pray. Father, we could devote our entire lives and all of our capacity to understanding these four words. The Word became flesh. We're humbled to utter them. To know that your love for us is so great and beautiful. That you saw this world and see this world and care for us. The light of the world shining in this dark place. And Father, I pray that you'd lift up our hearts this Christmas season to be encouraged and to ultimately see Jesus. So come and illuminate what you have already pres pres preserved, what you have inspired. We pray your Holy Spirit come and teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at these five verses in John chapter 1, verses uh, 14 through 18, what we're doing is looking at like the end of the introduction to the book. 
And John has the luxury of being the fourth of the four gospel writers. He assumes you know the story and you know what happened and you know what Jesus teaches. And he's going to spend the entirety of his biography on one topic. Jesus claimed to be God, proved to be God, and is God. So for 21 chapters, that's where he's going to go. And we have the fun of taking these last five verses of the introduction and say, well, that's, that's what he's telling us here today. That's what, that's what he's focusing on in these five verses. So as we, we consider where John is going with his, the whole of this, this book, he's going to say that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus made claims that he is pre-existent, he is God himself, and he proved it all over the place by showing that he has power over sickness, showing that he can take no resources and make something of it in feeding the 5,000, showing that he can bring the dead to life, showing that he and he alone can forgive sin. And so uh, that's kind of the background to this introduction. That's the whole of where John's going with the rest of his, uh, his book. And at the end of it, he says, you know why I wrote all these things to you? I wrote all these things to you so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life in his name. That's what this passage is about. That's what Christmas is about. That's what Christianity is about. Believing Jesus, you will have life in we will have life in his name. So the, the way I, I, what I see in these five verses, as far as like the theme of it, uh, is this. We know that we have received grace and truth when we see. All right? So I want to explain what I, what I mean by that brief introduction or that brief summary of these five verses. Uh, Christmas is not a time for mystery and, and wondering or hoping. Like, there's going to be plenty of, of amazement at Christmas. There's going to be plenty of, like, my mind is blown at Christmas. But there is no I wonder if at Christmas. There's no uh, maybe at Christmas. We know that we have been given gifts from God. And, by the way, the, the reason I say that we know we have received, if you'll take your finger and we're starting at verse 14, we've heard this read already, but go down to verse 16. Here's, here's why we're saying we've received it. For from his fullness, that is the fullness of Jesus Christ, we have all received, that's where we get the, the concept, this whole, these five verses is about receiving a gift. We've all received grace upon grace. So we know that we have received, and then the next part of the summary is grace and truth. And again, Christmas is a time of grace and in truth, grace is, is gift given. And so we do our best to give gifts and show the heartbeat of the season. And maybe you will gather tonight or tomorrow and exchange gifts with loved ones. That's an echo of who Christ is and what he's done. So the, the grace is this concept, though, of, of God giving to us. We cannot merit earn, put ourselves in a position where God owes us something. This is not a business transaction where the church of Jesus works really hard to do six things, and then he recognizes that that's good enough, and, and you can enter my peace. That's not what this is about. Grace is God, God's unmerited, unconditional election by the movement of his heart towards those who could never affect the change on their own grace. And so we see, by the way, just so you think, well, okay, well, why are you saying that's the point of these verses? Again, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Continue on. Verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, different but same. Grace and truth, grace and grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. 
three times in these five verses, grace and truth or grace upon grace is, is set out as like, this is what we're looking at here, grace and truth. And lest we fall into the trap of this generation, and the trap would be this, yeah, we like the giving. We like the gifts. So God gives us freely. We can't earn or merit it. We take it and move on with our lives and do whatever we want for the rest of our lives. Not so. And we know it's not so because it says he is full of grace and truth and truth and truth. You see, the truth part of this is that that everything that God says is validated in the grace. We can't have grace if we don't get truth. The truth comes to us and sets out for us this gigantic, immeasurable reality that everything that God says is reality. That that God owns everything. He is the authority over all. I might say it like this. Christmas is the call to realign your vision, your perception of reality to everything that Jesus says and all he claims to be. And we don't get that truth except through the grace. And when we receive the gift of grace, we receive the the gift of truth. Realign your entire life to this reality. God reigns. And so as we look at the Old Testament and we consider the New Testament, we look at the scriptures, these truths include this, that I am fallen in my sin, that I am a rebel against God's reign over me that I can do nothing to affect my position and I cannot uh, satisfy God's wrath against those who have rebelled against him. I can't do it. I can't make it up to him. He, in his goodness to us, sees us in that condition and sets out a course, which we're going to talk about for the rest of this message, of, of the truth that we're called to receive with the grace And so that's why we're saying we know that we have received grace and truth when we see. And the second part of the message, the end, we're going to talk about this question. Have you seen his glory? A couple years ago, Nikki and I went and saw the Grand Canyon. You'll see this this picture here. This is not one I took, though. Mine were better than that. (laughs) It's all we could find online. But I thought it was going to be like, all right, Nikki, let's go to this thing. Let's check this off the list. We'll see this valley and that valley. We'll go hiking in the, you know, old, the old South Park in, in Phoenix. And uh, we'll, we'll do the things that Phoenix has to offer. And we'll just check the Grand Canyon off the list too. But then we got there. And when we walked up to the Grand Canyon... Nikki and I, who, and in my mind, I was like, this is going to be great. This is going to be, I would use it like cool, like fun. We walked up, silence. We had no words. At some point, we went there for a couple of days in a row, there, there were tears. The majesty and the beauty as we waited. I would have had tears at the sunrise that night, but I was freezing to death. I did not realize how cold it gets at the Grand Canyon at night. Bring a coat if you go. But there in the shadow, as the shadows change throughout the day and the sun changes, you feel the smallness of who you are as you stand at this mighty, beautiful chasm. I just can't believe how amazing it is. It's changed my life. To this day, I can, I, I can picture what I experienced in that moment, and I feel small, and I know it's there right now. Like, there's been almost 700 days have passed from that day to this, and God just has the sun come up and go around and show the beauty and the shadows, and the, the beauty of his creation is there for anyone to come at any point to see how great it is. There's a, There's a Christmas movie, and I hesitate to reference it because I haven't seen it for years, and I'm not condoning it. Like, I'm not recommending. Like, don't go out and see it. I won't say the title, but when I explain the scene, you'll know exactly what I mean. But a family goes, and they're at the Grand Canyon, and it's been their goal to get to the Grand Canyon, right? And and so they drive the car up to the Grand Canyon, and the the husband is distracted, and and, uh, the wife turns to him and says, don't you want to see the Grand Canyon? He's like, we've got to go. We've got to leave right now. We've got to move on. Don't you want to see the Grand Canyon? And he goes, okay, let's go. And... They rush off in the car. 
And I tell that story because that's what a lot of people do with Jesus Christ. Look, I hear you describing him. I hear you telling me how great he is. I see, I even listen to the fact that you say you've beheld him. I'm telling you, I've looked, and now I'm looking away, and I can live my life happily and freely without thinking he's the greatest thing ever, right? And this is the difference between the call of what we are called to do. We are called to behold, to see his glory. And so that's where we're going as we turn now to verse 14. And the word became flesh. And the first concept we're putting together here, we know that we have received this grace and truth from God when we see that Jesus is the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We might think that's a funny, you know, title to give to Jesus, the idea that he is the word. But if we go back to verse 1, we can pick up on what John's doing as he's writing this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So you see his logic there. At the beginning, the word was there at the beginning. The word was with God. That is, there's separateness or distinction. The word was God. That is, there is singularity, and we are seeing here the threads of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, separate aspects of one singular God, and we talked earlier about the mystery of Christmas. Like, guys, we can't fully put into words the doctrine of the Trinity. What we are saying here is though Jesus came into the world as a baby 2,000 years ago, John is doing his best to show, to show us, and he's showing us well, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but the word has always existed with God. He was never created. He, he never developed. He's not improving In the beginning and at all times, Jesus is the Word, and he is with the Father from the beginning, whatever beginning you imagine. And so the deity of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. It's the hallmark of Christianity. If Jesus isn't God, then his death doesn't bring us peace with God. But Jesus is God. And that's what John is showing us here. He's equal to God the Father. And we see that he was present at creation. You can go to Colossians 1. All things were made through him and for him. And in him all things hold together. Jesus created all things before he became, uh, uh, took on him the flesh. He is God the Son. He's equal to God the the Father, not inferior to him. And we've already talked about the fact that John's going to take the entirety of his book to underscore this with the I am statements and showing that Christ has the same authority that God the Father. In fact, at the end of his life, it's evident and obvious that Jesus is put to death because he continually claims to be equal with the Father. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are unified and singular in the Godhead. And at Christmas time, if you're going to be mystified and amazed by anything, it should be this teaching, three in one. God is, has uh, singularity within the three parts of the Godhead. So, but why word? Why, do you, why does he say word? The word became flesh. And I think the reason for that is that to the Jewish mind, that would have really rang true. The word of God, when the word of God came to the prophets, everybody sat up and listened. Like the word of God and God are the same. And in fact, the, the prophets would never assume to speak unless God had taken the initiative And the word of God had come to them so that they have a message from God himself. We could look back at other places where the word is is equated with God the Father. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, right? So God makes a covenant with Abram. And the word of that covenant is a promise that is trusted always. 
We could go to Exodus chapter 20, and the law comes to us. And, and John takes great pains here to say, hey, look, don't think the law is bad. The law is the beginning of grace. Jesus is the fulfillment of grace upon grace, but the law is the beginning. Exodus chapter 20, the word comes, so we know what God intends for us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But the writer of Hebrews would say, but in these last days, welcome Christmas. He has spoken to us by his son. So Jesus shows up to speak what we will call and what the scriptures refer to as the final word. So there's not another one who could have done what Jesus did. And there's not another one coming, either past or in the future, who could, who could accomplish these things. Jesus is the only one. He's the one we were waiting for. And he's the one who was the word and spoke as from the Lord. Jesus is not then a word from God. He is the word from God. He's the final word from God. Jesus is the final and perfect message. Have you ever had like last words, like somebody spoke to you their last words? I've got, I've got last words and I could start naming names of people and I sat with them and usually if you're going to hear the last words, they're going to die slowly. They're, they're going to be, you're going to have a moment where you understand the end is near. And so I have last words written down from seven, eight different people in my life. And I love them. I was reviewing some of those last words because Jesus is the last word from God. He's the final, complete word. He communicates everything God means to say to us. Two years and two days ago, Brad Equilin passed away. And I had the privilege of going to visit him in his final hours. I have some pretty cool last words from Brad Equilin. Some of them I'm not going to share with you. They're kind of for me. But he, last words, when you're in the last moments, there's no nuance left. You're not worried about nuance. You're not worried about hurting feelings. You're not worried about what will they think. You, like, get to the point. Here's what I wrote down from Brad, and I shared this at his funeral. Uh, be intense, John. Be intense. Don't waste time on stupid stuff that doesn't matter. I like those last words. I think that's Brad in a, in a nutshell. Come on, people. Get with it. Be focused on the thing that God's called you to. No nuance. Right Now, here Jesus, the last word that God speaks to us, his life is full of grace and truth. And we must do business with the truth. We must come to understand what that truth is all about. But here's the first point. You know that you have received grace and truth when you see Jesus is the word. Number two. We know that we have received grace and truth when we see that the word became flesh. It's one thing for us to say, well, we see that Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, has deity and is fully God. It's another thing for us to say that the God of the universe, happy in his heaven, with no obligation under any circumstance to come to the rescue, other than the fact that he gave us his word, he knew he was getting into this, God leaves heaven and comes to earth as a baby. That's what Christmas is all about. He comes to rescue us. And the message of the Old Testament was going to be, is this, that there, there's a man who will come. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, God says, uh, a seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the evil one. And so that word in Genesis 3.15, the seed is son, baby, offspring. And so from there, all throughout the Older Testament, this promise is re repeated time and time again. There's one coming. There's a servant coming. There's a man coming who's going to take away the sins of the world. The sins of the world cannot be handled through grace and truth by any other except this servant from the Lord. And we spent the entirety of our Christmas series here in the scriptures to, to underscore this. Galatians 4.4 4 underscores it. 
that at the right time, Jesus came born under the law, parentheses, human, to redeem those under the law from the curse. He and he alone is the only means of our hope. He's a real person, really born under the law. The wages of sin is death and must be paid. God is holy, and I have made myself his enemy. And so when we see that Jesus came as a person, we should be shocked and amazed, right? The only man should pay for sin, but only God could pay for sin. St. Anselm told us. So the word became flesh. Note that in the Old Testament, there's this progressive revelation. God keeps telling us more and more and more about this man who will be his servant, who will save the people from their sins. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, he says, hey, you know what his name is going to be? His name will be the Lord is our righteousness. So we begin to go, wait a second. Is it man or God? makes it clearer in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 when it says, yeah, it'll be in Bethlehem, but you know what they're going to call him? The ancient of days. That's the same thing that John's talking about here. The one who's always existed. We go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. This king will always sit on the throne of David. He will never die. He will rule eternally, and in the new year, we're going to study Zechariah, and I won't let any cats out of any bags, but I will tell you that Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, says God, in his revelation, said, they will look on me whom they pierced. And so in the Old Testament, we have this beautiful mystery of, like, there's a man who's coming, but this man is going to be God. He's the only one who could pay. And as we see that this man came as God to pay the sin debt that you and I owe, there's a couple of implications I think we can can have for our life. And here's implication number one. God leaves heaven, takes on him the form of a servant, of a human, and goes to the cross for you. I just summarized Philippians 2. Read that in your devotions this week. But here's the implication. He loves you. There is no love in this world that compares in any way, shape, or form to the love that God has shown you in Christ Jesus. Christmas is about love. Not not just a um, romantic love or just sort of uh, uh, old school like, like review, not just thinking through the past, not hanging to some old thought about. No, the love that God showed us is powerful, active, took initiative, accomplished its goal, proven in time kind of love for you. God loves you. Let the person of Jesus Christ show you and prove to you that God loves you. Secondly, it wasn't good enough for God. He, he did not intend to remain at some distance from you. He's near you. That's what it means here in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, we've been saying for the last several weeks, he, he set up his tent, and I think at least the word teaches us that he meant to come near us. I won't go into a long expose of how I feel about camping in this moment. But I will tell you this, that when you camp with people, you are very near to them. You wake up, they're there. (laughs) You don't take a shower, they're there. The raccoon steals the leftover food, I'm not there, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent. He came near to us. And that is the story of Christianity and the story of the entire scripture. God with us. Very near us. Hebrews chapter 4 says he wanted to do that so he would know what it was like to be human. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses 
He knows what it's like to be you. He had to do that because only a man should pay the penalty of sin, of course. Human. He takes on himself flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But when we say that God is with us from the Garden of Eden, where God uh, uh, had fellowship with Adam in the cool of the day, to Abraham is the friend of God and is close to him and meets with, there's a tent of meeting stuff there, to we come to Moses and God visits. And, and remember what happened? The people make the golden calf and they're like, hey man, we're, uh, we know we got to wander in the wilderness. And God is like, look, look, look. You guys so quickly turn to an idol, I'm done with you. I'm going to start over. I'm going to send you on ahead, and, and an angel will come and lead you. But I'm, I'm done. I can't go. And Moses comes before the Lord. You remember this scene? Moses comes before the Lord and says, Lord, all throughout the land, for the glory of your name, the, the people that you own and love, the people that are devoted to you, the most important thing about, it, about us is this. You go with us. You're with us. And Moses says, no, we won't go without you, Lord. And then we go on from there. And he says in Isaiah, the the baby that's born, Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew chapter 1, he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is with us before he goes to heaven. He says, I will send another comforter who's just like me, another of the same kind. I will be with you even to the ends of the earth, Matthew 28 says to us, he'll always be with us. And then when we get to Revelation chapter 21, which Gary so beautifully taught us just a couple weeks ago, go take a look at that online if you need review. Behold, at the end of time, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. Merry Christmas. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And listen, when he comes in that moment, he will wipe away every tear. And there will be no more death, and there shall be no more mourning, and no more crying, and no more pain anymore forever, for the former things have passed away as God finally and perfectly makes his home with his people. This is profound. It's a theme of Scripture, and it's only man should pay, only God could pay, and God is showing himself strong and near and loving to us as he comes. The word become flesh, and he has dwelled among us. The implication, God's kept his every promise. Jesus, full of grace and truth, brings hope to the weary person's heart. And now we see, finally, the third point we want to... We want to mention this morning, we know that we have received grace and truth when we see his glory. Uh, This week, this word was the word I spent the most time on. Because it's a weird word. I really, when I was young, we would be driving, you know, and the, the light would be filtering through the clouds in just such a way, and an angel somewhere would go, oh. And you would say, there, somebody in the front seat would say, there's the glory, the think of the glory of God. And I would sit in the back seat and say, what is that? What does that mean? Sunlight shining through? And the, the implication is that the sun is doing its job and that we, we have visible representation of its effect on us. And so I get it. But it just seems like Christians say the word glory and we walk around saying, well, glory, and we sing glorified, and we, we talk about it, and the rest of the world is like, I don't know what the heck they're talking about. I don't know what they're talking about when they say glory. Glory is not a mystical word. The word glory means to say that God has made evident what was previously hidden. God has put on display what anyone and everyone could see is his faithfulness. In fact, we would say it this way, his holiness. When we look back at Isaiah chapter 6, and we hear, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who uh, the whole earth is full of his, and in my mind, if I'm writing that with Isaiah, I'd be like, okay, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his holiness. That's not what it says. Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. 
Glory is God making manifest, and just think of this word when I say manifest, billboard. God sending a billboard that is irrefutable and on display at all times for everyone to read about his holiness. And he did it in Jesus Christ. And so this is the Christmas question. Do you see his glory? The word see here in verse 18 is not like, have you seen it? It's not like what I was talking about before with the Grand Canyon. And you take a look and you peer and you're like, yeah, okay, fine. It's good. It's good. I, I like that. I, I, set my, I checked it off my list. And there are people at Christmas time that believe that if you go to church at Christmas time or if you make tacit um, acknowledgement in your head that there must be a God out there somewhere, that God's happy with you. And can I just tell you that it, the, the seeing of the glory of Jesus Christ is a radical reorganizing of your entire life under the reality that God says Jesus is. It is you and me letting go of, of my definition of what I wanted my life to be and fully embracing the grace and the truth that comes from Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. So glory contains two aspects. It's heavy Heavy indicates that, that we don't take God lightly. You don't move heavy things from place to place. When they're heavy, they stay put, right? God is, and his word and what he's done for us is heavy. And secondly, is this idea of fame. God is famous. And I say that, and people think Hollywood, or think I'm going all crazy young on him or something like that. No, it just means this. I'm not going crazy young. It just means this. The whole world can glance at God and say, you know what? I live my life without you. I'm fine without you. I'll take parts of you, the parts I like. Glory, fame, means one day every knee will bow before God and say everything you ever said about yourself and reality is true. Christians see the billboard now in Jesus Christ. We're sure of him. We know it's him. There's no other way. Fame is every tongue will confess Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whereas right now, all the words and all of the eyes and all of the messages can be all over the place as far as how we esteem Jesus. But those who have seen the grace, who have received the grace and truth of God right now see Jesus as the ultimate reality of the universe and the ultimate truth to bow their lives to. Friends, God means to be seen. You say, well, this billboard thing, what are you talking about? Look at verse 18. God, no one has ever seen God, the only God. We might say it this way. He's invisible. You can't see God. And that is true. You can't see God. And that is one of the problems of this generation, where they will come to you and say, you really believe? You really believe that Jesus came to take away the sins of the world, and there's no other way to have peace with God? We say, well, that's what, he, that's what he said. Yes, if you're asking me if I believe Jesus, I believe Jesus. God cannot be seen. He is invisible. Continue on. But the only God who is at the Father's side, Jesus, the Word, he has made him known. He wants you to see what he's like. Jesus came to put God the Father on display. He came to end this problem that we don't know what God is like, that we've never seen him, that he's invisible. We can all look back and say, look, we have seen and we are focused on and we have fixed our gaze on Jesus who is the exact representation of God the Father. We finally see God. Jesus has come. That is the invitation of Christmas. God means to be seen. And so we live in a world of those who have not seen. 
Because here's the, here's the three responses that we could get to, have you seen the glory of God? Response number one, don't want to see the glory of God. Don't want to. And if you're here today and you're like, yep, 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 heard it all before. I'm here because of uh, my mom. I'm here because of my son. I'm here because of whatever. Okay. Keep coming. My heart, our heart is not to be beating people up with the truth and making you feel guilty. Our heart is to expose the claims of Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Our heartbeat is that even if you're here today and you say, look, I don't want to see his glory. Welcome. We're really, really thankful you're here. Second response. I want to see his glory. But all this talk about how great his glory is and how certain you are and how you see God the Father and and the word became flesh and you see the, the ground of all reality in Jesus, I just don't see it. You, you talk and you say all these words, but I'm, I'm just not there yet. And the question would be, what do you do with yourself if you're like, hey, man, I want to see it, but I just don't quite see it. Keep coming. Keep coming. The first answer, if, if someone said to me, the ultimate reality of the earth and world is, is there and uh, for you, but, but I don't see it yet, the first thing I'm going to do is ask myself, do I want to see it? And if I do want to see it, how do I get there? The scriptures say that it's by grace. It's a gift of God. And the Bible says clearly that if anyone comes after the Lord, he will in no wise cast him out. He wants you to be near him. And if you're here today and you're like, look, man, I don't see it so clearly, our heartbeat would be that you would engage, that you would talk to someone, that you would pray and ask that the Lord show you. Number three, third response. I see it. We know that we have received grace and truth when we see his glory. Third response, you see it. My favorite Christmas movie, and there can be no debate about this, or else. (laughs) It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. And it's because, uh, you know, the whole story, I'm going to tell it to you, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, I mean, spoiler alert, it's like 100 years old, so... If you haven't seen it yet, that's on you. I'm about to tell you the end of the movie, all right? So he goes and he, he does all these great things. And by the way, it's like two movies in one. If you have to break, break when the angel shows up. It's a long story. But nonetheless, uh, the whole first half of the movie, it shows him saving his brother and then his brother saving all these people in a war effort. It shows him uh, doing kind things. It shows him marrying his wife and the children come. It shows him, uh, you know, having, like he wants out of Bedford Falls more than anything. He just wants to leave more than And he gets stuck there for years. And so finally, he's at this place where he's stuck in Bedford Falls. His life is coming to nothing. His brother's getting all this glory and accolades, and he wants to die. I mean, literally, that's where one part of the movie is. And so this angel comes and shows him, okay, well, let's let's erase you from this scenario, and I'll give you the ability to see what life would be like in this world without you. And so the brother dies. His wife never marries. Uh, Bedford Falls falls into a deep darkness of horrible, you know, uh, uh, immorality. And uh, the great quote of the angel at the end is, oh, you've been given a, good, a great gift, George, to see what it's like if you would have never lived. But at the end of the movie, he comes back and, and to his life, and uh, it's snowing on him, and the cop comes, and he goes home, and he is so excited, and it's, it's a famous, iconic scene, you know, Merry Christmas, old building and loan, and all of these things, and he runs into his house, and there in his house is a bank examiner and a cop, and the bank examiner, examiner says, hey, you know, you've stolen all this money, right, because that's the whole theme of the movie, is he gets into trouble. And uh, he, the bank examiner starts talking. He's like, I know, we've misplaced a lot of money. I'm in trouble. And the other guy starts talking, and the cop says, and I've got a paper here. And he goes, I know, I'm going to jail. Isn't it wonderful? And here's the point of me telling you this story. Nothing had changed for George Bailey. He was still 
short money. He, it still appeared that he had taken all the money. He was still going to jail. But he began to see all the things that he actually had in his life. He saw that his brother had made a difference. He saw that his wife mattered. He, he uh, sees that uh, his kids look up to him. He sees that even though he's going to jail, maybe he'll get out of jail pretty soon, right? And so the whole concept of this new mindset. And, and, and I sometimes will cry at the end of that movie as they're singing about George Bailey and, and his brother comes, his war hero brother comes at the end and says, here's to George Bailey, the richest man in Bedford Falls. Because he sees life differently now. And if we can celebrate and see the point of a literally a, 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 a fictional movie and the difference that a person's life and the impact we have on one another, how much greater, like that's a drop in the bucket compared to the ocean of the fullness of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has accomplished on your behalf. Do you see that your experiences and your situation can be exactly the same? You could be at the end of a relationship and not know why. You could have a terrible diagnosis. You could be going to jail like George Bailey tomorrow. Your dollars could be completely out. But if you can lift your gaze to the beauties and excellencies of Jesus Christ... That ability to see Jesus in your trouble can change everything today. And you can have a completely different Christmas. And the only thing that changes is this. Have you beheld the greatness of the glory of Jesus Christ? He changes everything. Let's stand and be dismissed. Father, I pray for the one who has the worst Christmas ever this year. I, I'm looking out here and I know there are people who first Christmas without. Real troubles facing them. Expenses they just never knew would, would, would come, and they don't know how they're going to pay. Dreams about the way they wish tonight or tomorrow would be, and reality is just not measuring up. Father, Christmas is all about all is well. And Christians are not faking that. We are not making it up. We are not merely optimistic. We have the promises of God in the person of Jesus who came and died in our place to gain your approval, love, forgiveness, redemption forever and ever and ever. And I pray tonight, tomorrow, into the new year, we act and live with our eyes fixed on Jesus. We have beheld his glory. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And everything has changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Merry Christmas.